Hi, welcome to another edition of This Issue. My guest this time is Reverend Bill Bliss from Bath. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bruce. Great to be here. Glad to have you. Uh, you're the first person that I ever had on my public access show when it began in December of 2003. Wow. <laughs> now we're 16 years later and the 150th show. So thanks so much uh, for being here once again. You're so welcome. It's really an honor to be with you and, and to have been a part of this whole This Issue project through the years. Yeah, it's great. Why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and what you do? Let's see. Uh, I, I serve as pastor of the Neighborhood uh, United Church of Christ, a congregation in Bath. Uh, for 20 years I've been doing that. I've uh, been a pastor for about 30 years now. And the exciting news for me is in the last year I became a co-pastor and included, uh, we've included a new pastor on our staff in Bath, Holly Reed, who just got ordained about a week ago. So we're f filled with that excitement. I'm really into uh, the church as a community of transformation and of loving kindness and uh, healing for the whole world. And you all have a weekly uh, neighborhood cafe where you feed anybody that walks through the door. That's right, yeah. How long has that been going on? I think we're in our ninth year of the neighborhood cafe. It's a free restaurant. Uh, it's one of the things that motivated us about four or five years ago to move to a restaurant in downtown Bath. Um, it's just how we do church on Tuesdays. We call it the the uh, Liturgy of Hospitality. It just goes on all day. Um, probably about 60 or 80 people come there for dinner, maybe for 20 of those people. It's the best meal they'll get that week. Um, but for the others, it's just time for community, for making friends, falling in love, getting in fights, talking with people across tables. What a, what a wonderful uh, community building thing it is. Yeah, too. it really has been a lot of fun and, and very rich experience. Yeah. Uh, we just returned, uh, you and I, my partner Mary Beth, uh, and uh, 21 other people. So 24 people, we just recently returned from a study tour to Russia where we visited Moscow, Crimea, and St. Petersburg for just over two weeks. Uh, why did you choose to participate in this delegation? Well, really, first of all, and I don't know if the camera will show you blushing when I say this, but really because I'm an admirer of, of your work, Bruce, and I heard that you were making this trip, and I said, how are you putting your delegation together? And you invited me to consider coming. And I just really support what the Global Network Against Nuclear Weapons uh, and Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space does, and I've been, so I've been a longtime admirer of your work and the work of Veterans for Peace. So those two organizations, the Global Network and Veterans for Peace, uh, inspire me, and I wanted to be a part of what you were doing. Um, a couple other things, if I may elaborate, yeah, too. Yeah. Um, I've, I've long been a, a student of Russia. I studied Russian in high school 45 years ago. I thought I knew the language somewhat. Found out when I got there I knew it much less than I could remember. Well, yeah. I, w I remember you reciting a bit of a Pushkin, was it a right, Pushkin right. Uh, yeah, I had poem to be prompted the whole time. Yeah, on yeah. on Russian TV while we yeah, were there. Yeah, that was fun. And I did. Over, two, over a couple of weeks, I, I got a little more fluent. Um, but it was also really an opportunity for me to, to include my family. And I, I invited my two sons and my wife to come. Lucinda could not make it because she was working, but um, our sons, Lincoln and Ray, age 26 and 24, were able to come, and that just made it so much more rich of an experience for me. Those guys also have really deep Russian interests. You know, uh, my son Lincoln is a uh, really knowledgeable about uh, Marxism and the entire uh, uh, revolution that happened in in Russia. He knows pretty much week by week what happened from 1917 to 1922. And so I learned so much during the trip from him about mm. actually how Marxism and socialism works. And he studied the Russian language, correct? And he also studied Russian. So he actually, we learned that he was better at speaking Russian than I. Um, and then uh, my son Ray, who's 24, also uh, majored in college in political science, but really focused on Russian history. So it was really fun to be there with them to learn on the spot and in location about all these amazing things that happen. And then during our free time, we just said to Ray, you tell us where we need to go. And that got us into all kinds of interesting places like the Fabergé Museum, which I never would have gone to otherwise in St. Petersburg. Um, 
So, but really underneath even those reasons, um, my reason for going was I think the, the motivation for the whole trip, which was to, to connect with local people in Russia from local people in the United States, to get beneath and beyond the story that we're so constantly told uh, about how Russia is our uh, sworn arch enemy forever. I grew up with that ideology. I grew up with the Iron Curtain and the Cold War. And, and you, I, you said your father built a uh, bomb shelter that's right, yeah. during the yeah. Cold War. Yeah, in, in 1963, my dad started building a bomb shelter and did build a bomb shelter in our basement. I always like to add to that that by 1967, he was standing out in front of Longfellow House in, in Portland protesting the Vietnam War. So he took those years to, to look inside uh, what was really happening there. And, and uh, I, I don't know how he would have felt later about having built a bomb shelter, except really glad that we haven't had to use it. Well, is there one experience in particular uh, from the trip that inspired you? Well, I really was moved, deeply moved. Um, when we were in Moscow for the first five days, um, you all set up a, a series of more or less seminars in the morning where people came to talk to us. And, and so many of them really inspired me and opened my mind. But I was really struck by, by the artist in the group, uh, Konstantin Semyon, I think is his name, who's a, who's a musician and a dissident uh, and, a, and a journalist also. And it was something about the edge in him. Uh, I've known a lot of people on the edge who, who, are, who are prophetic. That's the, the, the prophet's edge, who just has a message he needs to share. Mm. And so often the systems that control the way we, we live on this planet don't allow the prophetic voice to come forward. So I really heard and was inspired by his, his prophetic voice, his artistic voice. I think it's um, the artists so often who arrive or who see before the rest of us see what the real issue is. So was there something in particular about Constantine, uh, what he had to say that really stuck with you? I think it was just the thoroughness of his knowledge and his awareness of things. Um, he had a real global understanding of the issues before us, uh, that it's really an oligarchy problem and, and that it's an economic and military problem that, that affects the entire planet. And, and that he was also really aware of the uh, climate crisis aspect of that. And that he held all that with compassion for the whole world. It wasn't just parochial for himself as a Russian. I remember asking him about Pussy Riot because that's what we hear about here in the United States as a, as a dissident artistic expression. and. And his response was really clear. He said, well, I don't know what difference they make because they don't understand the economics of it. They don't understand socialism versus oligarchy and, and global capitalism. And, and so he was really clearly on that edge. Um, but more than anything, it was the edginess of him, his, his, uh, uh, how much he cared and, and uh, how much he wanted to share and make a difference. One thing that I think he, he I, we could say that he said and that we heard repeatedly is that people there generally, when you asked him about Putin, what do you mm -hmm. think of Putin, that generally people would say, we like, we generally like his foreign policy because he's reestablishing uh, Russian sovereignty, mm -hmm. you know, that saying that Russia has a right to exist as a country without interference from the West, but that the growing poverty, 18% poverty in Russia, uh, largely because of the uh, introduction of capitalism in their country, the privatization that happened mm -hmm. uh, with the Chicago boys and the Harvard boys economic teams that were sent in mm -hmm. after the collapse of the Soviet Union mm -hmm. to help privatize that country. Uh, the legacy of it, having these oligarchs really uh, controlling much of the, the economy is problematic. Right, they talk about it as the lost decade when the, just everything that they had got given away to, um, to oligarchs in, in a very mob, mobbish way. Yeah. 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 So uh, in the end, what uh, unique perspective uh, did you personally bring to this trip, do you think? Well, yeah, thanks for asking. You know, I come as a person of faith. Um, and that's the perspective that I brought. I think that um, that's something that can unite us all, all across humanity. I, um, 
uh, so I'm a Christian, a North American Christian, uh, a disciple of Jesus. I've taken the trouble when, when it became my time to become an ordained minister, I said, well, there's a missing piece for me, and that is trying to get a handle on Native American spirituality. I am technically a Native American. I was born here. I breathed this air and ate the food of this land. I wanted to find out um, how the folks who've been on this land for millennia related to spirit. In America, we, we tend to have a, a very myopic understanding of history. We really do believe that history began right around 1492. It's one of the amazing things about being in Russia, that people there are connected to their history for millennia, and you can really feel that. And when you're talking about even the recent World War II or what they call the Patriotic War, that happened on their land and cost them 28 million lives. For us, it was a more remote affair. Um, there is deeper history in the United States. So I, I took the trouble many years ago to find a teacher and to bring Native American spiritual practices into my own practice. So it was really, really um, neat to go into sacred places in Russia. And we visited many of them. And I was kind of laughed because people in, in our delegation would look at these old buildings and say to me, oh, Bill, this must be really important for you. And you, you must really feel the, the depth of it here. And that's really not the case for me. I, I don't find buildings in general inspiring. In fact, sometimes I see in the buildings the disease of religion as much as the inspiration of it. Um, but I did notice how devout the Russian people are in their sacred practice. And, uh, and they, uh, it's the, largely the Orthodox it is, Christianity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and how that survived through the communist era and then it was always there, but now has, it is being expressed more openly. So I really enjoyed going into the sacred spaces and with courtesy and consideration, bringing the, the Native American practice of simply honoring the six directions, uh, east, south, west, north, earth, and sky. And, and going into the spaces and locating east and finding, just doing that very simple prayer. Because I think it's so important to connect from our ancient tradition of our land to, to the ancient tradition of that land. Um, so that was a unique perspective I brought. I tried to find out if there were um, faith communities in Russia that are leading uh, in a prophetic manner and, and taking issue with injustice and, and trying to bring right relationship and, and build community. And uh, I wasn't able really to find out much about that, but, but I did uh, enjoy and, and was nurtured by participating in, in the, the Russian Orthodox services. Um, just beautiful. They're singing. very different, aren't they? Yeah. We, we were there during Easter, the, the we Orthodox were. Easter. I got two Easters this year. Yeah. Did could you just give a little bit of uh, a flavor of uh, what that Orthodox Easter experience was like? Yeah, it was uh, a lot of people participating, so it was obviously really important. They, we were able to uh, go to the Easter vigil late on Saturday night, and. Um, there, so I, I hear that it was attended. I was not able to go that night, but I heard from others who went. I went to, to morning services uh, several times, but I hear that it was just really full and lots of young people there. Y you have to be prepared to stand for two or three hours sometimes in those services. Um, but the ones that made more impact on me were just in whatever town we'd be in. I'd go out to the 8 o'clock service and just stand there, uh, listen to the singing, um, and pray praying with people. Yeah. Could you share any other uh, stories of things that you saw or felt while you were there? It's really interesting to be in the group of 24 of us and the uh, wonderful people in this group and the dynamics within the group were, were quite interesting. I was at age 62, I think the fifth youngest, which will tell you what the demographics were. So it was wonderful to have my children, 24 and 26, along and have just a uh, really beautiful man named Will Griffin, who must be in his mid-30s, was there, uh, and have him, having him talk about his experience as a veteran of the, of, uh, the Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, I've interviewed was, him on this show. Oh, okay, so Will's been in this chair. Yeah. I, I was so happy to have my children interact with someone who, like Will who has that experience and who is, came out of his military experience with a, a commitment to working for peace. Um, 
it was just also just great to be with people who had made a life of, of this work uh, and to see how we all in different ways interacted with, with Russian people. I was blown away by the, the guides that we had, um, Leonid and Tanya, so knowledgeable, so generous. Um, so those were all wonderful things. But more broadly, I would have to say that my takeaway is having my Cold War mind blown wide open. I did grow up with Cold War mentality, and that stuff is, is, settles really deeply. Uh, and, and I knew that so much of it was, was made up. And, and, and some of it was, was real, too. But I, 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 you know, I've, I've read and studied, and I, I see how the Cold War has been a strategy of the military-industrial complex and the permanent war economy and all that stuff. So I knew that. But to go to Russia and connect with people one-to-one uh, -one, and to do what we called citizens diplomacy and just to have people say, oh, you're from America. We're so glad you're here and we want you to know about us. Probably the culmination of that was marching in the May 9th parade, which is their celebration of the end of the Patriotic War, of the Second World War in St. Petersburg. And the tradition there is for everyone to get out in the street and carry a photograph of a loved one who served in the war and simply to walk. There's some singing of songs and some chanting, but simply to remember. And you have a really deep awareness that from the Russian perspective, um, they defeated fascism and uh, Nazism uh, for, on behalf of the world with, with lots of help. But they had the, the struggle right in their home. And to be in St. Petersburg, where in the siege, a million or so people died, many of them of starvation and then be with the descendants of those people, carrying photographs of loved ones, as I carried a photograph of my father, who was in the Navy Medical Corps in World War II, and have conversation where people remembered, we used to work together for common purposes, and then to feel that we can do that again. We, what about Crimea? We went to Crimea, we visited three cities there, Simperopol, Yalta, and Sevastopol, where the Russian Navy is located. Mm -hmm. um, what was your experience of you know knowing that Crimea is a controversial issue? Uh, Russia is accused of taking or stealing or annexing mm -hmm. Crimea from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. What's your experience of what you learned and saw about Crimea? Well, first of all, you're aware you're in an extraordinarily strategic location on planet Earth, militarily and culturally. So whoever holds Sevastopol has a lot of uh, military authority. And so you can see that it's really important for Russia to have that uh, strategically. And so that when NATO and, and uh, the United States have been systematically encroaching on that, um, it's evident that it's, it's imperative for the Russian people to, to uh, keep control of that. Um, and they've had... Uh, Russians have uh, held uh, Crimea since 1783, I believe it was, yeah. during Catherine the Great's time. Right, right, in a, an alliance that, yeah, with, in an alliance that they made then. It, one of the other motivators for going to Russia in general was to, uh, in response to what I've learned about what NATO and the United States did in Kiev and in, in Ukraine in 2014, and so it was really inspiring to go to, to Crimea and to see some of the aftermath of that. So Crimea was part of Ukraine when it was a Soviet republic. And the people in Sevastopol and Simferopol said that they, when the intentional disruption of the government in Kiev occurred in 2014, they could feel that they were next and that because of the strategic location of Crimea. Uh, and so it was really a wonderful event when we got to uh, attend the um, a, a conference with four of the people who organized the uh, people's referendum in the fall of 2014, just a couple months after the Maidan episode, um, which disrupted the, the government in Kiev and, and turned it into what many people told us was just a barbaric situation cultivated by NATO. Uh, and so these folks organized a peaceful referendum. They got a very high participation among the voters, and it came up with a 96% um, 
majority that said we would like to, to reconnect with Russia. That story gets told globally as Russia annexing Crimea. So it's very interesting to, to get that perspective. And know that, yes, the Russian agenda was, was in that effort as well. But you, you could hear from the Crimean people that that was a relief to them. And of course, the Russian government immediately poured in infrastructure and started building schools and bridges and, and, and mosques. And so that it's, a, it's a, a relationship that works for both of them. Um, Crimea is just a, a, a beautiful, beautiful place too. And that was what really blew me away. Probably one of the most moving things for me was sitting in a park for about an hour in Simferopol and just watching families, teenagers kicking a soccer ball, families teaching their daughter how to walk around a fountain and just, just life and just feeling, oh, that's what we have in the United States. Let's, let's connect, let's celebrate our, our common humanity. Mm. Say more about uh, the situation of the United States and NATO today, militarily sealing the borders of Russia, uh, claiming that they must protect the world from an aggressive Russia. What's your reaction to all that? I try to think empathetically as an American, and I ask myself, how would I feel if there were so-called missile defense installations happening in Nova Scotia or Quebec or Alberta, or for that matter, Venezuela or, or Cuba. Mexico City. Mexico. Or, we, we know yeah. that we would have to respond to that. And so, you know, I'm a citizen of a country that has 800 military bases around the world, has a $800 billion and increasing military budget. And we visited a country that has 150 million people and a, I think a $60 billion and decreasing military budget. So it's hard not to recognize that they feel beleaguered and, uh, and under threat. So I have sympathy for that. Uh, and I recognize their, their need to um, express and exert their identity as, a, as a, uh, a global power as well. You know, in the last two years, Russia has cut their military budget. Uh, and when Putin was reelected recently, one of the first things he said was that he was cutting the military budget for the second time mm. uh, because of the growing poverty, 18% poverty in the country. So I say to myself, wow, it would be nice if we had a president who would say, you know, recognizing the growing disparity, economic uh, disparity in this country, we're going to cut our military budget as well. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's just the opposite. Yeah. Uh, why do you think in the end that the U.S. and much of the Western media is demonizing Russia so much. What's really behind that? What's the purpose of it? Well, I think f we're selling fear, and fear is a really easy sell. I think fear is easier to cultivate than cooperation and loving kindness. Um, I'm not thoroughly sophisticated in my understanding of global economics, but it feels to me like oligarchy, uh, banking, and money interests are, are driving uh, what, what I've learned to refer to as the permanent war economy, the economy that thrives when we keep uh, building more weapons. And we know that weaponry is the number one export of our country. So it feels like that agenda is being expressed uh, all in the name of, of fear of, of the other or the stranger. One more thing I think needs serious consideration. When you look at a map, Russia has the largest land border with the Arctic Sea. Mm -hmm. And because of climate change and the melting of the ice, it's now possible to go up and drill baby drill in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. uh, the Rand Corporation, based in Santa Monica, California, has come out with a study saying that the U.S. must balkanize mm -hmm. Russia or break it into smaller pieces so that Western oil corporations will have access and control of much of that border area to the Arctic to drill, baby, drill. So I think as the Russia is demonized, Putin is demonized by the West, it makes it easier for the American people and people in the West, NATO countries to say, yeah, okay, go ahead, we'll give you more money so you, you can uh, protect us from that aggressive Russia when it's really, I think, just the opposite. Yeah, you don't have to look too hard to see the extractive industry's hand in, in all of that from, from the, uh, second to last Secretary of State, who you know, was an ExxonMobil uh, CEO. So you don't have to look too hard to see that agenda. And 
Uh, it was really encouraging in Russia to find a strong concern about the climate crisis, and they're very aware of that, as people in the United States are becoming aware as well. So my hope is that we'll be able to shift away from that. As always, um, when power comes under threat, it, it doesn't go hide in the corner. It, it lashes out more and more, and it feels like that's part of what we're involved in right now. Well, we've got just less than two minutes left, Bill. Why don't you make a <clears throat> closing comment and say whatever you might like to say to the viewers about uh, your experience going to Russia? Oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, how, what a, what a, how fortunate I am to have been able to, to be a part of this trip, to, to meet not just the other people in the, in the delegation, but all sorts of people whom I will stay in touch with uh, in Russia really um, to have a, a connection you know you can't quantify it but I, I just believe that having gone and spoken with several hundred people in Russia looked them in the eye marched in a couple of parades with them uh, really asked sincere questions from our, uh, my interest and their interest I just believe that that sort of thing makes a difference and, and adds up to healing for, for humanity and, and the whole planet, which is hurting a lot right now. So I'm really grateful to have been able to go. And we were so glad to have you. Bill Bliss, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you, Bruce Gagnon, for, for, being, for leading that. And thank you for watching another edition of This Issue. Until next time, good luck to you all, and please get organized.